Mercy and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Wasn't that a great presentation? It really puts the issue at heart, and we'll be discussing that next week in a very serious way, in the, as well as in the newsletter. The cost of following Jesus, of having the cross. And I think the challenge is there for each one of us. Are we really willing to take up our cross and follow him? Now, we've been doing a series on the Lord's Prayer, and today and next week, we're going to be focusing on forgiveness. Today, we're going to be focusing on the vertical dimension of forgiveness, that is, between God and ourselves. And then next week, we're going to be talking about the implications of that in our horizontal lives. Remember, the Lord's Prayer says, and forgive us our trespasses, that's the vertical dimension, as we forgive those who trespass against us, which is the horizontal dimension. Today we'll be focusing on the vertical dimension. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you're always ready to forgive. You're there willing to accept us. And even as we might return, you're already on your way towards us. Before we even have a chance to voice anything, as the Father and Son, you're there for us, Lord. And we thank you. And we ask that you help us to understand what it means to be forgiven. And as we together look at your word, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to the insert. You all have that in the bulletin. It's just this little uh, piece of paper that we... Uh, Xerox. And it says, in this petition, request changing sinner to a person who is morally challenged. Have you noticed in our society, whether it comes under the guise or rubric of uh, politically correct, or whether we just, in our daily conversation, uh, we tend to minimize sin. Now that's always been going on, in one way or another, but as this particular little cartoon points out, we have the tendency to want to remove the label of being sinner and adopt a label which is not really quite as direct or as truthful. We tend to say, okay, we are morally challenged. Well, isn't that nice? I mean, being morally challenged, you know, that's sort of a nice thing to do. And, and in our spare time, we might be uh, take that up, you know, just like we can accept any kind of challenge. Just being morally challenged doesn't really confront us. And the first aspect of forgiveness is to confront our sinfulness. It's not to cover it up. It's not to hide it. It's not to sort of look at our sinfulness and say, well, it wasn't all that bad. It was just a little lie. It wasn't really all that serious. The reality is that we in our society minimize the sin and come up with all sorts of other words for it. Adultery is no longer adultery. It's having a significant other. And we can go on and on and talk about all of the ways in which we have a tendency to sort of whitewash, so to speak, our sinfulness so that we don't really have to confront it. But if we don't confront our sin, we are not able to experience forgiveness. We don't even need forgiveness. If you really don't think that you are a sinner and have done nothing wrong, then why do you need forgiveness? You only need forgiveness if really there is something wrong. And do you? As Luther, for example, did every night, he would go through the Ten Commandments and he would ask himself, what have I done today which violated the First Commandment, which violated thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. And you know that our Lord not only left those in the actual physical act, but also saw sin as something that we did our own lives. When you look at somebody lustfully, then you are already committing <coughs> adultery. When you are looking at somebody hatefully, you are already committing murder. And so we are about some serious business. We need to do some serious analysis when it comes to our own lives in order to confront our sin. 
One of the favorite stories in scripture is the story where David, King David, who has everything. In fact, God says to him, I gave you everything you wanted. I would have given you more if you had asked for it. And he's sitting on his couch or wherever he was, and he's looking over there, and he sees Bathsheba sunbathing or bathing, and uh, he decides that that's the woman that he wants. And you know the story. He goes out, and he has an adulterous relationship with her, and asks for the commander of his army to put Uriah, her husband, in a position where he would inevitably be killed. And so he, in essence, is arranging for the murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, and he lives his life. But what happens? What happens is that Nathan comes and confronts him. And remember, he tells him the story about the little lamb and how the master of a huge, huge farm with all sorts of lambs. And there was another one, a farmer who just had one lamb, and the guest came, and uh, the guest needed to be fed. And rather than taking one of his many lambs, the master took the lamb away from the poor farmer. And David is outraged. And Nathan says, you're the man. He says, you're the man. You're the one who committed this crime. We have to call a spade a spade. We have to be certain in our own lives to confront the sin again and again and again. And if we don't confront our sins, we're not going to be Now the second aspect to our sin is to confess our sins. That's an interesting point that I think we need to dwell on for a moment. It isn't just enough to know that we have sinned and to confront it. We also need to confess it. We need to confess it to our Lord and we need to confess it to one another, those whom we have offended or those against whom we have sinned. We'll talk about that part next week. But we have to confess it. And here's why. Psalm 32 is the psalm that David wrote when he had not yet confessed his sin, when he had not yet been confronted by a mentor, and we all need mentors to confront us about our sins. And in Psalm 32, David writes the following about the consequences of having sinned, but not yet confessed. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sap as in the heat of summer. And then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And things changed. The reason we need to confess our sins is that those sins, if they are not confessed, if they are not dealt with, will continue to eat away at the inside of ourselves and our relationships with other people. I read a little story about this girl who didn't quite understand English the way it uh, was spoken. And when they came to the passage that uh, forgive us our trespasses, she thought that she said the following, forgive us our trash passes as we forgive those who have passed trash against us. But you know, there's a lot more truth to that than first appears. When sin takes residence in our hearts and in our lives, we have trash in our hearts. We live with trash. And the bad thing about trash is not just the trash itself, but all of the things that it attracts. Uh, Tony Evans, who's a pastor and preacher down in Dallas that Karen and I heard this past week when we were in Chicago, he says, hey, when you have sin in your heart, you attract all sorts of other sins, all sorts of Literally, if it's trash, you attract rats, you attract all sorts of other vermin, you insects, and all sorts of things come along with the trash. And that's also true for us in our lives. When we fail to confront our sin and we do not confess that sin. There was a girl by the name of Sally, and she had a brother named Johnny, and I try to get names that, that nobody could hear ass, so I call it Johnny rather than Johnny. And uh, they were living with their grandmother and grandfather. And one day, Johnny was out there, and he had a slingshot, and he was trying to get some game, and he couldn't get anything. And finally, he came across his grandmother's pet duck. And so he shot it and hit it and killed it. And he took it, and he hid it behind the, some bushes and the wood pile. And uh, as he turned around, having just completed his act, there was Sally standing with a smile on him. 
And that evening, when it came time for Sally to do dishes, Sally said, no, Johnny would like to do this. Don't you, Johnny, remember the duck? And uh, Johnny said, yeah, yeah, I do. And the next day, it came time for the grandfather to take somebody fishing. And uh, he said, Johnny, would you like to go fishing? And Sally said, no, oh, he doesn't really want to go fishing. I want to go fishing with you instead. Remember the duck. And you know, this went on and on and on. And finally, one day after he was just, he was just kind of bothered by the fact that, that Sally was taking advantage of him. And he went to his grandmother and he said, you know what I did? I killed you today. And she said, oh, I'm glad you told me because I was standing at the window and saw what you had done. And I forgave you, she said. But I was wondering how long you would be a slave to Sally because you failed to own up to what you did. You see, when you and I do not confront our sin and do not confess our sin, we have trash in our lives that we need to deal with in some way or another. And sooner or later, it will come out. Finally, if we are serious about confronting our sin and confessing our sins, we need to also be serious about committing our lives to living a life that is filled with, with an attitude of humility which asks God to forgive us for the sins that we have, to convict us. You know, sometimes we go around all day and we don't think we've sinned at all. And I found in my own life that that has never been true. <laughs> uh, sooner or later, when I spend time during the day, I'm going to come up with sins that I've committed. And some people have even calculated it and said if you commit 10 sins a day, which isn't really all that often, I mean, just think about how often you have thoughts about somebody else that you wish you didn't have, either because you were angry at them or because you're lustful. How many times do you find yourself in a situation where you put God second to your life? I mean, you can go on and on and on. And let's just say that we have 10 sins. You know how many sins that is in a lifetime? A lifetime of 50 years? It's 175, 180,000 times that we have sinned. So all of us have plenty of opportunities to both sin, to confront, to confess, and to commit ourselves to going again and again to our Lord Jesus and asking Him to forgive us for those sins. Yancey, one of my favorite authors, uh, Philip Yancey, has written a number of books. This one is here, What's So Amazing About Grace? If you haven't had the opportunity to read it, I would recommend it. You're welcome to borrow this copy and read it. And make notes in it if you want, and just sign it. Okay? Uh, that way you increase the value of the book. And uh, so if you want to borrow it, please do. But in his book, he tells of a, a time when he was together with a man named Daniel. He knew him because they both went to the same church. And Daniel had asked him whether he would please meet with them because there was something very important that he wanted to discuss with them. And so they went out and had lunch. And during lunch, he dropped the bombshell, Daniel did, and said, I intend to leave my wife. They've been married for 15 years, had three children, and he was attracted to a younger woman. And Philip Yancey said he was just shocked. He said he had no reason to believe that Daniel would ever do anything like that. There was no indication. He seemed to be a very active member of the congregation that they attended, and it was a real shock. He said, before he even had a chance to recover from the shock, Daniel said to him, he said, tell me, Philip. He said, do you think that God would be willing to forgive me for what I am about to do? Now think about that. Do you think that God would be willing to forgive me for what I am about to do? He was asking for forgiveness ahead of time so that he could have a clean slate to sin more, wasn't he? He wanted to have assurance that he could engage in whatever sinful life he wanted. And that God would be nice enough to forgive him for his sins. As John Stuart Mill said, and I quoted it before, he said, I love to sin, God loves to forgive. I can't think of a better arrangement. And some people live their lives that way. And Philip thought about it. He thought about it and he writes in his book, page 178, I believe, 179. He writes in his book that 
the silence and the question was like a snake that was lying on top of the table. He said he didn't really want to pick up the question. But finally he said to him, he said, you know, the problem isn't whether God is willing to forgive you. The problem really isn't whether God is willing to forgive. He has forgiven all sorts of adulterers. He has forgiven all sorts of killers. He has used them in his kingdom. So the issue is not, will God forgive you? But the issue is that if you insist on sin, you're distancing yourself from God. And every day that it remains unconfessed, unconfronted, and unconfessed, you're farther and farther away. And there will be a point when you will no longer be able or willing to return and ask for forgiveness. And that's important for us to hear. Confront, confess, but let's commit ourselves to allow no distance between ourselves and God. But we constantly go to Him. Because we need His forgiveness. And we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order for us to ask for that forgiveness. Are you distant from God? Do you feel far away from Him? As the old adage goes, He hasn't forgiven. But we may have.